Welcome back to CurrentDeities.org. Today we're going to be looking at evil races in fiction. Now, as an offshoot of our series on Oscar Wilde's The Decay of Lying, we're going to be tackling some contemporary topics in aesthetics. Today we're looking at the question of evil races. Now, to understand this, there's a debate around whether one can include so-called evil races in a work of fiction. Most commonly, this is a debate in the worlds of fantasy or science fiction. There are two questions present in these debates, whether it's moral to include evil races in fiction, and whether a well-written story would include such races. While often this debate is had over video games or role-playing games, we're going to expand it to include any and all fiction that is telling stories in some way. Now, before digging into the philosophical questions here, it's important to clarify what we're actually talking about in terms of an evil race. While some may raise concerns about including non-conscious, non-sentient monsters and creatures in a work of fiction, these are rarely the focus of debate. Few would begrudge you killing a bear or a Tyrannosaurus Rex that was trying to eat you any more than killing a, a hydra or a, a hellhound. And we rarely ascribe moral agency to things we claim lack consciousness or sentience. So including a mindless mythological monster in a work of fiction is not the concern here and isn't something we'd count as an evil race. Conversely, we're not talking about people who are part of a culture that has immoral norms or rules that some may agree with and others might not, and a vast majority of the culture may agree with and accept them, but that they're a cultural choice in some sense, not something that's inherently born into you. These are cultures that condone slavery, cultures that condone genocide, etc. We're also not talking about a group of people who choose to do evil in some way or who have become a certain type of monster out of a desire to do evil, or are part of an evil group, nor are we talking about a species that has a tendency towards harm that they're able to resist. Vampires that can choose to drink cow blood instead of human blood, dwarves that are quicker to anger or have some propensity for violence. These, none of these are the things that we're talking about. So now that we've understood the things we're not talking about, let's look at what we are talking about. The ethical and aesthetic concerns arise when a race is depicted as inherently, irrevocably evil, and yet having sentience, consciousness, sometimes even social structures, culture, etc. This is what we're referring to when we raise the question of a quote-unquote evil race. Think of Tolkien's goblins and orcs, Robert Jordan's Trollocs and Myrthral, Joe Abercrombie's Shanka, or C.S. Lewis's Boggles and Hags. Now, these evil races are often appealing to authors and video game creators and so on because they give players something that is smart enough to fight back in a certain way, but is considered evil enough such that players can attack them or kill them on site without having to go through a question of, is it moral for me to be doing this? This can apply in a video game, in a role-playing game, but also for protagonists in a book. There are several questions that arise philosophically, both in the realms of ethics and aesthetics related to evil races. With respect to ethics, one might ask if something that cannot do otherwise can truly be considered evil, as most hold that ought implies can. If you should do something, it should be the case that you are able to do that. And so if a race of creatures is not able to do something, then, i.e. they're not able to do good, then it seems like they, we can't think that they should do good that they don't have moral agency in some way. One might also be concerned that fiction may reinforce discriminatory beliefs against certain groups of people that they are inherently evil, and in doing so, fiction is augmenting that harm in some way. In terms of aesthetics, we might argue that evil races are poor writing because they're simply not realistic, because they oversimplify important or interesting moral questions. There's an interesting question in all of this. And the underlying question for you is if you're creating a story, whether that's just a story you're telling someone, whether that's a role-playing game campaign, where it, whether it's a book that you're writing, uh, should you include evil races? Now, first, there's the simple ethical question of whether a species that cannot make moral choices can be considered evil or worthy of punishment. What makes a race that can only do evil, importantly different from a deadly virus that can only kill. 
Is it even coherent to imagine something that both has a society and a culture, but is also inherently evil? Remember, we're not talking about something that has an urge to do evil that they could resist, but rather something that has absolutely no choice in the matter. A lot of questions around what counts as not being able to do otherwise get tied up in metaphysical questions of free will and determinism, which we're not going to focus on too much here, in part because, to a certain degree, in whatever fictional world you're creating, you could choose to make it a world where libertarian free will does exist, and people can choose to do otherwise in an important way, or morality works slightly differently and a certain version of compatibilism applies. Check out our series on free will for more on those specific terms. Like I said, we're, we're not going to touch on it as much here, because an author can make specific choices around those things within a world. Now, one way to conceptualize how we might be able to think about holding someone accountable that doesn't have a choice is to think about the difference between an army of orcs that are naturally evil and an army of humans that are being mind-controlled to do evil. We seem to think that the latter is morally blameless, that if you're wandering around and you're being mind-controlled to attack and torture people, that there's some moral blame for killing a person like that. And while the former, the army of orcs, is evil, and we should feel no remorse for killing them, despite the fact that neither of them really had a choice in the matter. Perhaps what drives this is that the orcs seem to take pleasure in the killing, and often these evil races are described as gleefully going around and killing and torturing people, and it's what they live for, it's what they enjoy, whereas the mind-controlled either feel deeply guilty about what they're doing, or actually feel nothing. Perhaps it's not the fact that they choose to do wrong, that makes them morally responsible, but the fact that they take joy in doing wrong in some way, even if they had no choice. If the orcs were crying out that, we don't want to do this, but we're being forced to, it might be a different moral calculation. Though there are questions as to whether whatever makes them inherently evil also takes away their moral compass, making it impossible for them to feel remorse, making them seem once again in some way blameless. And part of the problem here is there is a deep metaphysical question of whether it could really be possible for something to be sentient and in some way importantly morally responsible, but also not be be, be inherently evil and not be able to do good in some way. So there's, there's some deep metaphysical questions that we could grapple with here. But that's not the main focus of this video, so we'll, we'll, we'll set those aside for the moment. Setting aside the questions of whether beings that can have no choice could even be considered evil, there's an ethical question for an author as to whether it's morally permissible to write stories where entire races are portrayed as inherently immoral. First, we're going to look at the argument for why this might be ethically problematic, and then we're going to look at three possible defenses for the author in terms of the ethical question. Now, the key ethical problem is that races in fiction can be seen as allegories for races or groups in real life, and in many works of fiction, they are explicitly used this way. See many of the fantasy races in Terry Pratchett's Discworld, J. Zachary Pike's Dark Prophet Saga, or Catherine Addison's Goblin Emperor. Some works start with a race being played as generically evil, then subvert this trope later by making them oppressed or more nuanced, Sometimes something we can see in how Klingons are portrayed in Star Trek's original series versus how they're portrayed in The Next Generation and later, where other alien races are often used in some ways to represent oppressed races on Earth, where you have the whole of DS9 being in some way about colonialism in fascinating ways. Or we can see this in works such as Ichiro's Oda's One Piece, where merfolk are initially portrayed as generically evil, but then the group that the audience initially encountered is later revealed to be a splinter group, merely reacting to their own oppression by trying to oppress others. And so often what will happen, either because a series decided to become more understanding of this, or purposefully to subvert this trope, is we will see a race through the lens of it being an evil race initially, and then later realize that that was something that needs to be subverted because this race is actually more complicated, more nuanced, and not evil at all. What this leads to is the problem of 
starting to think, wait a second, these series where races are being portrayed as inherently evil, maybe they're only on the first half of that swing, and we should be going to the other half and saying, maybe this is actually a complex culture, and these people are being driven to this. It's not that they're deeply inherently evil. If some fictional works use other races and species as an allegory for real-world races, then it can seem that works of fiction which have inherently evil races are endorsing racist ideologies, that people that are of a different race are inherently evil. This is particularly challenging when these works are all using and referencing the same set of races, orcs, goblins, etc., Someone reading Tolkien's portrayal of orcs as inherently evil, and Pratchett's portrayal of an orc fighting against the perception that he is evil, and his own fears that he might be inherently evil, might think that if Pratchett is using orcs to critique racism in the real world, Tol Tolkien, therefore, is endorsing it. And there are problems here with issues of reinscription, the problem of reinscription. Check out my video on that, where even if the author never intended the races to be used to portray or support racist ideologies, they may be reinscribed or stolen by and reappropriated by members of racist groups to defend or define their racist ideologies, even if that was never either the author's original intent or even something that was directly written into the books, but has been in some way reinterpreted because it's sufficiently nonspecific as to what these allegories could apply to. Check out the series on postmodernism and the problem of reinscription for more on that. Now, this challenge is further compounded by the corollaries between real-world racist propaganda and fictional descriptions of evil races, in part because the fictional descriptions of evil races and the real-world racist propaganda are trying to do the same thing. They are trying to make you feel something. They're trying to get your blood boiling against these evil races. The propaganda is attempting to make you dehumanize and believe that these aren't things that are uh, worthy of having any amount of sympathy for. The fictional descriptions in the books are trying to get to you to feel things in the sense that any fictional text tries to get you to feel things and empathize with certain people and hate others. A well-written villain is something that makes you hate them. And so using those psychological strategies that make you hate something are the same psychological strategies that would be effective within propaganda to make you hate individuals. Racist propaganda often depicts people of other races as unintelligent, brutish, selfish, but quick to have children and overrun society. Similarly, goblins, orcs, and the like are often described as unintelligent, brutish, and selfish, but sufficiently numerous to be a threat. This tactic of intimidation and ridicule, where characteristics are ascribed to a group to both demean them and at the same time make them seem to be a threat, is a very common tactic used in propaganda to dehumanize people, and also an effective way for an author to get you to hate or dislike a particular evil race sufficiently to dismiss any moral qualms you might have with the protagonist going out and killing hundreds of them. Even further challenging this is the actual beliefs of some pivotal authors in fiction. There, is, there are debates as to whether any number of famous paragons of speculative fiction were actively racist or merely use, ended up using these tropes because they are effective at inciting emotion and have later been reinscribed by particular racist groups to have a different meaning than those authors initially intended. However, H.P. Lovecraft, who is a deep uh, an important figure within speculative fiction was unabashedly racist, and many of his stories are horrific because they play on certainly primal fears of race mixing, society being overrun by people of different races, etc. Unlike other authors, there's no real debate as to Lovecraft mo Lovecraft's motives. Read his 1912 poem, the title of which would get me demonetized to even say if you are unsure. Don't worry, just look up 1912 poem. The title will probably give you sufficient information, but reading through it will certainly if that doesn't.
The problem for much of speculative fiction is that, due to the common reuse of characters, races, worlds, etc., the importance of pastiche within, within the genre, this can mean that other authors import these ideas into their works without intending to reproduce the racist tropes. The works of Lovecraft helped in many ways to define the genre, and succeeded in being truly horrifying, often because they play on primal, irrational, racist fears that many of us may harbor, and creating works that reference Lovecraft that exist in kind of a Cthulhu mythos may also unintentionally be playing on and reinforcing that same xenophobia. And so the proponent of excluding evil races may say that this is problematic because you are bringing in these tropes that were initially used to increase people's xenophobia and therefore may have the effect of actually increasing xenophobia and hatred of people that are different. Now, the underlying ethical argument here against evil races in fiction is that they reproduce racist tropes, aggravate conflict in the world between groups by reinforcing the viewpoint that there are some types of people that are inherently evil, and therefore we shouldn't be listening to them at all, we shouldn't engage with them in rational discussion because they are evil. They create this kind of antagonistic us-versus-them kind of world, and they reinforce that idea that that's the world we're living in. There are evil people out there who can't be reasoned with, who are bad, and they allow us to accept the dehumanization of others through propaganda more easily since the dehumanization is portrayed as accurate in fiction, and they help us absolve ourselves of guilt in the harm that we do to individuals outside of our group, as we may be prone to emulate the protagonists that feel justified in harming those of evil races. Now, in the face of these challenges, there are several defenses that the author might offer. Now, one of them comes from the viewpoint of aestheticism. If you haven't checked out the earlier videos in this series on Oscar Wilde, The Decay of Lying, and Aestheticism, you should check them out now. For the aestheticist, <clears throat> art is above moral critique. There are no moral or immoral stories, merely well-written and poorly written ones. Art should be the lies that do not represent the real world. Art should be different. It should be separate from life. It shouldn't try to follow or emulate life. It should be more than, different than. Now, while this might fit some of the claims of the aestheticist, this argument for evil races in fiction, it seems challenging to square with others of their ideas, such as the idea that life tends to emulate art as opposed to the other way around. If life does emulate art, this seems like an argument in the opposite direction. Because if art is portraying something that's immoral, it seems we might be concerned that such a portrayal might escape into the real world. Life might attempt to emulate art, and therefore, actually, people might start believing that certain races of people are evil. And so even if aestheticism is going to offer us this kind of moral support of saying that art is above moral critique, they're also going to expose some of the problems with the argument here of saying that it's possible that people would start to emulate these ideas in reality. A more effective response, then, might be to claim that uh, a claim that appeals to escapism or hedonism. One might argue that the purpose of fiction is to give people pleasure, and a world that is has simply black and white morality provides pleasure because it's easier to navigate than the real world. The escapist might argue that the consumers of such fiction would be no more expected to be more racist after reading it than they would be to attempt to do magic after reading a fantasy book. Similarly, we wouldn't expect to be evil simply because the main character in a book is evil, even setting races aside. If we are following a book where the main character, the viewpoint character, does bad things, it doesn't seem to follow that someone that is reading that book would then do bad things. Rather, people seem to be able to differentiate between, this is just a book, I'm not going to do what's in the book. The point of fiction in this view is that it is not real, that it is divorced from reality. People read fiction to escape from their daily lives, including the multitude of real moral choices that they need to make every day. They read fiction to imagine that that world where those choices are easy, where there's a clear good and evil exactly because they are aware that the real world is not like that. If they thought that the real world was clear and black and white, then such fiction wouldn't be an escape from that. 
Fiction is appealing because people understand it as different from reality, not because it successfully replicates it. For the escapist, what they're claiming is not merely that books can be effective at providing people with an escape from reality by portraying reality as something that it is not, as inherently full of uh, black and white moral decisions, but going a step further and saying that the people that are reading these books to escape reality inherently understand that those books do not represent reality because the only reason they would be reading them would be to escape from their reality. And the third defense the author might offer relies on John Stuart Mill's harm principle, and it's used to defend all range of free speech. The idea is that there's not a real harm being done here by speaking, that portraying a particular imaginary race as inherently evil is not doing any real harm. It's engaging in a marketplace of ideas. In fact, Mill would go so far as to defend your right to say that a race of real people is in fact evil, drawing the line only at not telling an angry mob of people understanding that that might incite them to real harm. So you could write in a book that a particular real race of people is evil. Just don't tell that to an angry pitchfork-wielding mob of people that might go out and do real harm. But you're free to write it in a book. Check out our series on Mill and free speech for more on Mill's harm principle and where exactly he draws the line on free speech. Now, even if there's a satisfying response to the ethical question for evil races in fantasy, there's still an aesthetic question. Does including evil races in your work of fiction make it poorly written? Is it simply lazy writing to create races with no moral agency? Does it diminish the moral choices of protagonists when those around them do not have any moral agency? We're going to look at two arguments that evil races are bad writing and two responses to them. So. First, the first aesthetic argument against evil races comes from the realism camp. Specifically, it's the claim that evil races are just not realistic. No humans are actually born inherently evil, therefore such stories are bad stories because they don't map onto reality. A simplistic response to this might be that fiction, particularly fantasy and science fiction, are inherently unrealistic and therefore we should not be concerned with them mapping onto reality. But many realists might respond that the goal is not realism of subject matter, particularly if we're dealing with speculative fiction, but rather stylistic realism. That the relationships should be realistic, and that relationships with characters that must be immoral, that cannot make moral choices, are simply not realistic. That a world in which the protagonist is able to be a real, full-fledged, three-dimensional character that has important moral choices, facing antagonists that don't have those moral choices, is not realistic. It's not something people can relate to or understand. No one will understand the perspectives of those antagonists in some way because they're not full-fledged characters, and that may in turn diminish the protagonist's own agency in making those choices because they're not making an important decision around is this something really that I should be facing off with? Is this uh, something that's sufficiently evil for me to fight it? Rather, they're saying, well, that decision has been made for me by the author. These things are inherently evil, so I, I don't have to make those kinds of choices, which is not realistic either for the things that are being portrayed or for the protagonist needing to make such simplistic decisions. In contrast, certain aesthetic functionalists might object, claiming that the purpose of art is to critique society and perhaps enact positive social change. This is a subset of functionalists. Not all functionalists are going to argue this, but some may. Some functionalists are not claiming that it's immoral to right evil races, simply that the goal of art is to provide a critique of society and make the world a better place, and that art that includes real evil races fails to do so and therefore fails to achieve the goals of art. For the functionalist, fiction, particularly speculative fiction, is an opportunity for using the tropes of these genres to approach challenges of society from new viewpoints. For example, using fantasy races allows us to approach issues of race from an abstract without the baggage of our own race or questions of historical specifics bearing us down. In some ways, this is similar to stepping behind Rawls's veil of ignorance. I don't have the same preconceptions about a dispute about race between the dwarves and the elves that I might about my own race or races in the real world. Pratchett famously uses the idea that all dwarves have beards to explore the ideas of 
a culture that hides their gender identity in public, and the challenge is if someone in that gender identity wanted to start exposing their gender identity in public. Pike's Orconomics uses the lens of traditional D&D tropes to critique racism in the modern banking system. Evil races reinforce harmful stereotypes instead of challenging them from the functionalist perspective, so such works fail to achieve their purpose. Now, one response to these critiques is from the aestheticist perspective of formalism. This is the idea that a work of art should be assessed based on its form, not based on its ethical mandate. Does a particular work fit into the form of its genre? There are several reasons one might think that evil races fit the form of traditional fiction, particularly classic fantasy. Looking at Tolkien or Lovecraft as the establishers of spe speculative fiction as a genre, it seems to fit the form, as both of these used evil races in their work. If an inherent component of fantasy is the necessarily evil race of foes for the protagonist to kill without remorse, then evil races are a key component of the form. Now, we might be worried about such a response because it seems a bit prescriptive of what makes a good fantasy book. It would mean that there are many fantasy series without evil races, Realm of the Elderlings, Discworld, Harry Potter, and so on, that aren't really good fantasy because they don't fit into the formula. Formalism so strictly defined also seems to discourage innovation in a genre that's inherently imaginative. A broader formalism might allow for such works, but would not provide the same strength of defense to the idea of evil races. However, a broader formalism might provide, be permissive to evil races as a possibility to include in a fantasy work, but not be prescriptive that one must include them, which is going to get a little bit to the pluralism argument that we have in a bit. The broader you get with formalism of saying that all of these things are allowed, the more it starts looking like pluralism. Another response would be to say that it's not the purpose of fiction to perfectly depict everything, but rather to focus on specific moments, concepts, characters, and ideas. If a country experiences hundreds of years of peace and then suddenly breaks out into war, the author is justified, if not encouraged, to focus the action on the moment that things changed, focus on the interesting times. Similarly, in terms of content, an author may choose to focus on certain components of the story and not others. While some authors may focus on the ethical dilemmas of different races interacting, others might choose to focus on the specific tactics of a war and the ways that those tactics might change if magic or different technology were introduced. Such an author might create an inherently evil race not out of laziness, but because Morality is not the focus of the book. It's not the story that's being told. In the same way, an author doesn't have a responsibility, even if they're providing a realist account, to tell us every single second and every single moment of a character's life. They're allowed to pick and focus on the moments that are interesting, the moments that tell the story they want to tell. We could imagine that the same story could be told from two very different perspectives, not by changing what actually happens, but by changing the moments that are focused on. And so if an author cares about focusing on those moments of war and tactics, and not focusing on the moral decisions of, is war a good thing, should we be killing these creatures, they might choose to have evil races because that's going to diminish those questions they don't want to focus on and focus on the other questions. Another author might take the exact same story and focus on different moments because they have a different moral that they're trying to focus on or a different way they're trying to tell the story. This gets at the direct response to the claim of laziness. Specifically, it is sometimes argued that it's merely lazy writing to create evil races, as some additional work could make them more realistic, more three-dimensional. It could make it such that they are not a race of evil people, but people that have chosen this, that have this specific backstory, that are part of an evil organization in some way. However, the necessity of focus is a reason for not diving into the backstory of every minor character that walks through a scene. An author may be justified in not providing a full backstory story for every antagonist or group of antagonists, not from laziness, from, but from a desire to, of, towards conservation of detail, to giving the audience only what they need about the story to move forward, only those moments or themes that fit into the story as a whole. In line with this, a more effective response than the formalist one might be from the 
view of aesthetic pluralism, arguing instead that there's not one single goal of art, that limiting ourselves to attempting to duplicate reality or satirize it fails to capture the full potential of fiction. Fiction can do many things. It can serve as an escape from the real world, a challenge to make the world better, or as a mirror to show us who we are. We don't need to pick one, and we may on one day want to enjoy a work of art that feels deeply realistic, and on another day enjoy something that's very escapist and fantastical. In fact, pluralism may be where these concerns originate from in the first place. The challenge is not reading Tolkien or Pratchett alone, but rather in reading one and then shifting to the other. When one uses evil races in a way as a way to help you escape from mundane, mundane concerns about reality, and focuses on the epic adventure or the wartime tactics, and the other is using those same races to comment on racism in the real world, it can be hard to see how the first is not in some way endorsing racism, or the second is not actually critiquing the broad brush that the first is painting with, but they may simply be pointed at achieving different goals. What do you think? Are evil races in fiction immoral, or just are they just bad storytelling, or just pointed at a different goal of escapism or aestheticism than works that use race in fiction to comment on real races in society? Now, some of this may hinge on not philosophical questions, but empirical ones. It might hinge on questions of, do we really think that including evil races in fiction is something that does lead to people being more racist in the real world. If there's a causal connection we can draw there, you might be more concerned about it. If there's not a causal connection and people do really identify this as escapist and fantasy and are able to draw that line between what they're reading in a book that they treat as escapist and what they're seeing in the real world, there may be a stronger case towards saying that there isn't any real harm here, so we don't understand why there's a concern. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Watch this video and more here at carnhades.org. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. Uh, if you like this video and you want to see more, please uh, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell um, so you can catch uh, more videos like this. If you like this as a topic of us digging into kind of contemporary aesthetics, there are some other ideas that we want to play with that fit into a similar category of thinking about race, aesthetics, and ethics, let me know in the comments below uh, and we, we can put some of the more of those into the works. Stay skeptical, everybody.